morning everyone welcome to this GCSE English live tutorial and um, this is part two of our series on paper one question five um, from English language GCSE um, specifically AQA paper um, lots of you will have joined us for these sessions before um, when we've done uh, all the previous questions if you missed any of those you can catch up on the my GTU YouTube channel where all of our previous tutorials are hosted um, so I'm Tilly, I work at my tutor and our tutor today is Vicky, who lots of you know already, um, who hosts all of our English language tutorials um, and she's a trained English teacher and has done tons of lessons with my tutor. Um, so I'll just wait a couple of moments as people join the session um, and just a reminder um, that you can ask any questions you have for myself or Vicky by putting them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Vicky will keep an eye on the chat throughout and answer questions as they come along, but we'll also pick up some questions um, in a short Q&A at the end of the session um, if we've missed anything out. Cool, um, you good to go Vicky? Yep. Great, have a good session everyone. Right, good morning everyone. So this is, uh, as Tilly has said, um, our part two on the question five, which is the creative writing fictional section um, of the exam. So this is worth 25% of your marks for your entire GCSE. So it's vital that you um, sort of know as much as you uh, possibly can about this question to make sure that you do a good job. So today we are going to be focusing on setting structure and point of view um, and why those are useful and integral to descriptive writing. So as I said on Tuesday, and um, today I'm going to be looking at the descriptive writing question that you could get. Um, I looked at narrative writing on Tuesday and I'm looking at narrative writing again um, tomorrow just because narrative writing generally seems to be um, the more popular one. Personally, I find it easier and I think a lot of other people do as well just because you um, have the chance to tell a story. Descriptive writing, uh, you can't essentially. So in terms of what we've looked at so far, so question two was our language devices and features. Uh, question three is our structural features and question four is our evaluation of writers methods so we won't be using um, anything from the question four that we've learned so far just because it's not appropriate um, however we will uh, be using language devices and features on structural features that we've um, learned about in question two and three and applying those to our writing today i'm mainly going to be focusing on structural features although you will see in my writing language devices um, being used because they are an integral part um, for the marks and the content uh, side of the writing. So first of all, can you please tell me uh, any structural features that you can remember from when we were doing question three? Or um, anything that perhaps I haven't mentioned before that you would uh, like to flag up to me? Yeah, so stop fez is the um, sort of little rubbish um, acrostic that I use um yet yeah, cyclical zooming in a night fantastic omniscient narrator beautiful yep yeah. over the shoulder tone repetition ending yet yeah, these are all fantastic focus lovely yet yeah, so first person would be first person perspective uh start motifs lovely yes yeah. so um we will be looking at motifs in a lot more detail um in tomorrow's lesson um, and i'll be showing you how to write a motif in a, a piece of narrative writing yep lovely um i'm thinking is there anything that anybody has missed so um start setting transitions we haven't mentioned on this narrator perspective uh focus flashback flash forwards we haven't mentioned um, ending, zooming in and out, uh, tone, pace. Um, oh, that's interesting. I haven't heard of that one before. Analepsis. Um, edit. Yeah, edit comes in the pride smile one uh, for our question five, but you are right, it is important for our question five, so we do go back, edit and proofread. Fabulous stuff. Right, so um i think we have named all of them oh we forgot tension and characterization so characterization was one of our main focuses on tuesday's lesson fabulous stuff right so what ingredients then do you think make up 
a good setting description what would you expect to see in a successful piece of setting description five senses yet yeah, just be careful um, how you're spelling senses so uh, we need another s not a c there um cracking anything else what else would you expect to see in a good piece of descriptive writing yeah a variety of descriptive words yeah so getting that ambitious vocabulary in there so the more reading you do the more ambitious vocabulary you will remember and that will feed into um your writing so even if you're just reading a few pages of book every night, that would be fantastic stuff in prep for your exam. Uh, yeah, loads of adjectives. Um, oh, genre. Yeah, so I suppose with setting, we can sort of set up a genre, can't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we would expect to see a load of uh, language devices and features just because it bulks out our description a little bit. So similes comes under that one. Anything else? And then I'm just going to move on after. Um, we've had some more come through so anything else that you think we might expect to see do we think we're all done we've got everything i think we've definitely got the main points right so so why is setting important so we all know what setting is setting is where a story is set or where a particular seen in the story set so this could give us clues and insights into sort of themes we might expect to see the sort of events that might be happening um throughout the text so where do we normally get a uh, description of settings within the body of the text what position would we expect to see it in yeah absolutely right we usually get them in the beginning um however we it is very rare that we have one setting and we stay in that same place for the entirety of a um, story so we definitely one of the most integral parts of setting up the story is getting a setting in and describing it and that helps um, us in our understanding of um, the characterization the plot um, any themes that might be coming up the genre um, so that's really um, useful information that you expect to see in the beginning of the text but quite frequently you get a variety of different scenes and settings um, therefore you will see it throughout the text absolutely but we would expect to see um, a setting description right at the start usually to set the scene essentially lovely so i've got three setting descriptions for you then so which of these do you think is the most successful and why? So I'm going to read you three setting descriptions and I'd like you to, to decide which one you think is the best. So, over their irregular roofs would fall throughout the seasons, the shadows of time-eaten buttresses of broken and lofty turrets and most enormous of all, the shadow of the Tower of Flints. This tower patched unevenly with black ivy arose like a mutilated finger from among the fists of knuckled masonry and pointed blasphemously at heaven. At night, the owls made of it an echoing throat. By day, it stood voiceless and cast its long shadow. So that's from Titus Grown. This next one is from Oliver Twist. The public houses with gas lights burning inside were already open. By degrees, other shops began to be unclosed and a few scattered people were met with. Then came straggling groups of labourers going to their work. Then men and women with fist baskets on their heads, donkey carts laden with vegetables, chaise carts filled with livestock or whole carcasses of meat, milk women with pails, an unbroken concourse of people trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town. As they approached the city, the noise and traffic gradually increased. When they threaded the streets between Shoreditch and Smithfield, it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle. So that one's from Oliver Twist. And this one, has it fallen off the bottom? This one, I think, is from War and Peace. That Sunday, clouds spilled down from the sky and swamped the streets with a hot mist that made the thermometers on the walls perspire. Halfway through the afternoon, the temperature was already grazing the 90s as I set off towards Calais Candu. This isn't from War and Peace. I can't remember what this is from. From my appointment with Barcelona. 
carrying the book under my arm and with beads of sweat on my forehead, a grand stone staircase led up from a palatial courtyard to a ghostly network of passageways and reading rooms. I glided up to the first floor, blessing the blades of the of a fan that swirled above the sleepy readers melting like ice cubes over their hooks. I can't remember what this one's from. That's so annoying. It's written on the bottom. It's fallen off. Right. Which one do you personally think is the most successful um, and is the best one for descriptive writing? So we've got our first, second and third. Which one do you think is the best? And why, I suppose. So which one do you think is the most successful? Yeah, I said, I think this extract is from War and Peace, then I corrected myself. There is an extract from War and Peace coming up, that's why I thought it was from War and Peace. Yeah, I think the second one's... Um, very good at um i suppose telling you about the population and what the population act like within their setting um yeah i think the third one is quite nice as well in that it's um using a lot of pathetic fallacy within the setting um and this one i think is really nice in the sense that it um fulfills uh, a lot of personification and there is um, a lot of reference to religion which I really like. Yeah, they more, so the others sort of more describe um, the people within the setting and how they interact with the setting, so that's definitely a way and that you do it. Um, yeah, I think they all, they're all really good examples. Um, and I think it's probably, um, when I say which one do you think is the best, it's down to personal opinion. And what I was trying to get from you guys is why is that your opinion? And you've come up with some really lovely answers there. Right. So we've covered this question really, and how are these descriptions different in their focus? So yeah, some mainly use personification, some pathetic fallacy. So we're finding that a particular uh, proud smile feature, a language device feature is coming in um, quite frequently. Some focus more in how the characters react to their setting. So it's painting you, I suppose, a broader picture um, in terms of context. So those are all really important things. Right, so what does point of view mean and why is it important? So point of view um, is a similar, is pretty much the same as perspective. So how many different types of perspective can you think of that we've covered? So we've already named some um, right in, the, uh, in our starter there. Um, so how many can you name and what are the benefits of using a specific type of point of view or perspective? Why might you choose to use one over another yeah so over the shoulder first person third person yeah anything else so yeah we definitely have first and third person so first is sort of generally in its own category Third person, there are a few that we could um, talk about. So um, we have over the shoulder in there. There are a couple of others for third person as well. So uh, free indirect, which is um, non-biased. Uh, over the shoulder, um, omniscient narrator, so a narrator that is all knowing unreliable first person or we could just generally have a first person who's relatively unbiased but an unreliable first person um, point of view is quite an interesting one so can you think of any examples where one of these point of views or perspectives are used in the text so we've throughout our time together we've looked at a variety of texts so can you remember um, any of those and what point of view and perspective they are from or generally a book you have um, read recently. 
So I'm trying to think what we've looked at together. We've looked at To Kill a Mockingbird. We've looked at The Lovely Bones. Um, we've looked at A Christmas Carol. I can't think what else we've looked at. We've looked at a lot. Yeah, Lovely Bones is Omniscient Narrator, Over the Shoulder in Harry Potter. Yep. So over the shoulder is where we follow the protagonist or the antagonist, but usually the protagonist. So that's the uh, main good character. Um, and um, we sort of essentially follow his mistakes in Harry Potter and um, share his opinions and views, shall we say. Um, fabulous. Anything else coming in? Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, so it's not... Yeah, there are... There is an element of um, unreliable first person with Addison, you're absolutely right. Yep. Fab. And a little bit with Lanyon as well. Right, okay, so. Some examples then. So this is one we have looked at together. So this is uh, George Orwell's 1984, written in 1949. Um, so this is free and direct. So the party said that Oceana had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceana had been in, in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past? ran the party slogan controls the future who controls the present controls the past and yet the past though of its nature alterable never had been altered whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting it was quite simple all that we needed was an unending series of victories over your own memories reality control they called it in new speak double think so this is free and direct why is it free and direct Fab. Yeah, it's unbiased, it's third person, it's unbiased, it's um, very straightforward and it's just giving you clear, concise facts. Yep, absolutely. Let's have a look at our over the shoulder then. So I've picked a Harry Potter one. So Harry had never been inside Filch's office before. It was a place most students avoided. The room was dingy and windowless, lit by a single oil lamp dangling from the low ceiling. A faint smell of fried fish lingered about the place. Wooden filing cabinets stood around the walls from their labels. Harry could see that they contained details of every pupil Filch had ever punished. Fred and George Weasley had an entire drawer to themselves. A highly polished collection of change and manacles hung on the wall behind Filch's desk. It was common knowledge that he was always begging Dumbledore to let him suspend students by their ankles from the ceiling. So this is over the shoulder because we are seeing what Harry is seeing. So it starts with Harry had never been inside Filch's office before. Then it gives us a, a description which links back to our setting. So this is a description of setting from the perspective of third person over the shoulder. Unreliable first person. So I know I have mentioned this one to you guys before, but we haven't actually looked at an example. So this one is from The Great Gatsby. It is written from the perspective of a character called Nick Carraway, so he's within the story. So this is um, an extract. So I believe that on the first night I went to Gatsby's house, I was one of the few guests who had actually been invited. People were not invited, they went there. They got into automobiles which bore them out to Long Island and somehow they ended up at Gatsby's door. Once there, they were introduced by somebody who knew Gatsby and after that they conducted themselves according to the rules of behaviour associated with amusement parks. Sometimes they came and went without having met Gatsby at all, came for the party with a simplicity of heart that was its own ticket of admission. So by this starting with I believe we are getting opinions and throughout the Great Gatsby we get sort of Nick's opinions, Nick's points of view um, which we wouldn't get if we sort of had a free and direct or over the shoulder. He persuades us to think in the same vein that he does about the characters. Hence, 
he is unreliable. And then our last one, omniscient then. So this one is from War and Police. So just then another visitor entered the drawing room, Prince Andrew Bokonski, the little princess's husband. He was a very handsome young man of medium height with firm, clear-cut features. Everything about him, from his wary, bored expression to his quiet, measured step, offered the most striking contrast to his quiet little wife. It was evident that he had he not only knew everyone in the drawing room, but had found them to be so tiresome that it wearied him to look out, look at or listen to them. And among all of these faces that he found so tedious, none seemed to bore him so much as that of his pretty wife. So here we're getting inside knowledge about what a particular character is feeling. Um, however, it's from third person. So therefore, that would suggest that uh, the person that is narrating knows everything about what's going on inside people's heads. So that's what makes it omniscient. Fab. So how can the use of settings and a particular point of view interest the reader? What, what is the point of including them? Why do we need them? How are they interesting? Because if we include something, we are including it because it is interesting, essentially. So why do it? Yeah, you're right, Emma. So it is um, pretty much unbiased um, in, in the sense that it's not giving particular opinions, but it's also telling us the thoughts of people that um, we wouldn't know about if that narrator isn't omniscient essentially. So answers please then. So why are youth settings and point of view interesting to the reader? Why do we need them? Ah, is the indirect like the book? So is that Catcher in the Rye? Um, I think so. No, he would be an unreliable uh, first person because it's in first person. Free and indirect will always be third. Um, so let's just flick back a, for a moment. So omniscient can be first or third person. Unreliable first person obviously can only be first person. Over the shoulder will always be third, and free and direct will always be third. So, Catcher in the Rye would be unreliable first person because he's giving us all these thoughts and opinions on his parents, um, which um, are his opinions. He's making us feel a certain way towards his parents. Therefore, um, it's creating a biased picture of um, those characters and their characterization. Therefore, it's creating an unreliability because he's not being objective, he's being subjective. Following on from that, actually, can anybody tell me the difference between objective and subjective? I think that's quite an important one for point of view. Yeah, so setting and point of view are important because they can visualise, um, the reader can visualise where they are and sort of what they're looking at and um, I suppose potential tunnel vision um, if we're in first person or over the shoulder. Yep, thank you very much. So objective is fact, subjective is opinion. So for example, um, To Kill a Mockingbird has sold, I think 300 million copies, but let's say that that is a, a definite fact. I think that's what it, what's printed on the front of the book that I've got. I could then say that I really like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's one of my favourite books. That would be subjective, whereas 300, uh, no, 30 million um, copies of To Kill a Mockingbird has been sold would be a fact. So that's the difference between the two. And that's why it's quite important. Generally, we get facts from omniscient um, narrators because they know everything. Um, and generally, with free and direct, we mainly get facts. Whereas with being an unreliable first person narrator, we get quite a lot of subjectivity, which influences um, how we think. Um, and we start to, it, it's quite easy um, to think in the same vein, in the same mind as the narrator, because that's, I suppose it's the easiest way to read, isn't it? Not challenging their ideas. It's quite easy to just go along with. And I suppose we think, well, they have more understanding of these characters than we do, because they're actually there. 
Yeah, that's lovely, Raya. Yes, yeah, so Raya just said subjective information or writing is based on personal opinions, interpretations, points of view, emotions and judgment. That is beautiful. Um, it is often considered ill-suited for scenarios like news reporting or decision making, business or politics. Um, objective informational analysis, fact-based, measurable and observable. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. How do you write in second person? So, um, there are very few books that write in second person. Um, there are some examples out there, but they are few and far between. Just because it's a really, it's really odd to write in, in the sense that you are writing for somebody that you don't know. So you go into a wood and you find this and then you do this. And it's quite nice in that it sort of simulates and takes on a journey in the sense that um, you could potentially feel that you are in a virtual world like you might do with um, sort of virtual reality stuff that you can do now with technology or that you're perhaps in a computer game and you have your little avatar and you do this and you do that essentially. Um, however, I don't think I've ever come across anyone who's taught how to write in second person. Um, I mean, I'm sure there is someone out there who has done, um, but generally we don't teach to write in second person because it's really difficult um, to do generally, and then it's even more difficult to do well. So when it comes to writing in second person, if that is something that does interest you, I would suggest just having a quick Google, Google of some examples of second person writing, see what you can find and see what they do, because generally you won't be taught it in a classroom and you would be very much advised not to write in second person in your exam, uh, just because it's, it's incredibly tricky and it requires a little bit more craft, I think. It's something that I've never tried to do because it's tricky. Um, and we just generally don't teach it as a whole. There would obviously be uh, some people out there who are very brave to teach it, but it's not something that I think I would be brave to teach. It's really, it's really, really tricky. Right, so let's have a look at our question for today then. So write a description of a market as suggested by this picture. So um, as I said last lesson, um, you can have, uh, be given a picture, a title, a um, instruction or a sentence starter um, and then you have to choose which one of those you like you'd only get two options obviously but those are the potential formats you could um, get so first off with my planning when I get given a picture is I just um, jot off some general um, things that I can see um, so I'm just jotting down I can see crafting homemade items um, we've got quite a lot of nice green space here. I would say that this is either spring or summer, um, either late spring um, or summer, just because of sort of the amount of foliage that are on those trees. There's um, a really nice grand building in the background here, um, which is interesting. Um, we've got some beautiful cobbled streets. This reminds me of quite um, a quaint sort of town village that you um, might get in the UK, but I think. I wouldn't be surprised if this was sort of in Spain or France either. Um, I think this is quite rustic. Um, it looks, I think, relatively eco-friendly. What I really nice is, what I like is the um, soft canvas being used here. So generally in the UK, when we have markets, we sort of have metal poles um, and sort of quite rigid waterproof canvases. These seem to be sort of quite nice sort of cotton cloth material. Um, and the infrastructure is made from wood. It looks much more attractive to look at, essentially. And we've got quite a nice amount of um, light and shade. So I've just generally dotted down some things that I could talk about to start off with. Now, when it comes to actually structuring a description, this is um, how I organise um, my ideas. I think this is a really nice um, way to do it. Um, so, Thinking, have I actually written down my plan? I have written down my plan. So as you can see on here, I don't do it sort of beautifully and draw a table and all the rest of it because there's not time. Um, so I've just jotted down a few um, key bits. So I'm going to talk about um, it being summer. I'm going to talk about sort of the rustic nature. Um, I, I think I'm going to sort of aim for sort of countryside um, town, either a market, um, a market town or um, 
yeah, so we'll go market time. That seems the most obvious, doesn't it? Um, and I'd say this is a re relatively affluent area. It seems very well kept, very nice. Um, it's probably quite a nice sense of community because it looks so beautiful. Um, so I'm going to opt for here next. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, birds, um, sort of the movement and uh, chattering of people. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the movement of the trees as well. I think that would be really nice. Um, next big picture. So I'm going to turn my head and look down the end of the street. And then I'm going to sort of talk about sort of it being relatively picturesque, uh, the market melting away. And then um, I've already done my hair, so I'm now going for smell. So I think this one is quite different. So I'm going to go difficult one. So uh, flowers, blossom. Um, then I'm thinking sort of sort of things that you get in countryside sort of markets. I'm thinking handcrafted fudge would be gorgeous to talk about. And maybe old fashioned sweets as well. You get those quite a lot where you sort of um, sort of weigh by um, the gram. Um, so those are quite, I think that'd be quite nice to talk about. And then I think I'm going to focus on a particular stall. So I'm going to focus on sort of a hippie-esque stall. So I'm going to sort of talk about maybe crystals, uh, stones, dream catchers, just because I think there is a lot of mileage in how we could talk about that. Um, because they're so ornate and beautiful. Right, so um, as I suggested before, with your language devices and techniques, you need to get them in there. Um, so I'd write these down um, at, on some somewhere in your um, question um, and answer booklet um, and just jot these all down and then you can tick them off as you go. It's a nice little success criteria to get you going. Right, let's have a go at writing this then. I really love this picture. It's gorgeous. Right, so let me just double check questions before we get cracking. Yeah, you could definitely, um, you can sort of smell bark, can't you? So you could definitely talk about that. Um, absolutely. Right, so. So the scorching midday sun glared down onto the historic cobbled streets. Let me blow this up a bit before we go any further. Uh, cobbled streets. Right, I'm now going to get some advanced punctuation in there. As the scattered crowd bustled and floated between uh, the gems that caught their eyes. Right, before I go any further, can you, well, as I write the next few lines, can you work out what the point of view is and why I, why you think I might have chosen to do that. So, uh, the breeze brushed uh, through the valley uh, of purchasers. Purchasers. Um, creating a gentle uh, rustle of leaves. above their heads although they did not notice their intrigue and determination was not to be disturbed right so what point of view am i writing from um extra bonus points if um you can identify some language devices i've used in there Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's third person, free and direct. Yeah, fabulous. So I've chosen to go third person indirect with this one, um, just because with description, I think it's really easy to fall into writing a story 
um, and it's something that I've seen a lot of my students do. So what I would suggest with your descriptive writing, if you feel like you might be at risk of falling into a story, I think trying to use third person instead of first person might be a little easier, or at least I, per I personally find it a little easier to write um, in third person in direct and it stops them falling into um, writing a story a little bit more anyway for me. Um, right. Uh, the gentle clashing of leaves encouraged uh, the calls of innocence from birds. They're scintillating. I knew I was going to spell that wrong. Scintillating. Um, where did I get to? Summer's song drifted weightlessly above the landscape unnoticed by those below so again i'm repeating this idea i've got a transition that um sort of these people aren't paying attention to anything um but i think because i've already written notice here i'm going to change this to ignored um just to show off um that I'm um, not repeating the same language, I'm able to um, use um, different vocabulary. Right, ignored uh, by those below. The beehive, so you will notice that this is um, shorter um, than what you would um, expect to be writing in an exam, uh, just because um, we've only got a limited amount of time to write together and um, so you would be expected to write more than this so the gentle clashing of leaves encourage the calls of innocence from birds they're scintillating some song drifted weightlessly above the landscape ignored by those below so i've got some advanced vocab in there i've got some sibilants i've got a metaphor um Beehive below, um, hummed louder. So I've got some uh, personification as they exchange honey between themselves. So this is more of an extended metaphor, essentially. I'm referring to the people um, sort of who are browsing, buying as uh, busy bees, essentially. They all search for liquid gold. Right. At the other end of the street, the stones melted into a pathway uh, leading to serenity so i'm getting in uh, my advanced vocab here now going to get in my rhetorical question how could anyone want to be anywhere else startling blue sky so now i'm getting my more vo advanced vocab in here by doing a list startling blue skies ornate independent shops beautiful uh, flower beds brimming so I'm now getting into more personification with life nowhere could compare so I'm getting in a simple sentence there The fragrant smell of cherry blossom, twisted and turned through every crevice. So I've got some um, alliteration and I've got some personification in there. Now I'm going to get a simile in there, like a prima ballerina. Ballerina. Um, she draped her arms gracefully around each and every um, one of the proprietors. 
proprietors. Get rid of that. There we go. Right. Uh, proprietors, where have I got to? Filling them with melancholy. Filling them with melancholy memories uh, of their childhoods. A Victorian style stall stood proudly fumigating So I'm now getting more advanced vocab um, in here, the area with its own handmade concoction. Fudge. This mixed with nature's own creation created a euphoric unmistakable perfume this was the smell of summer right so far so good relatively in terms of the um, length it needs to be longer for the exam but you you get the idea um, delicately um, tucked away in a quiet corner lay a stall of treasures. The owner of the stall, a timid middle-aged lady draped in shawls, perched like a canary on the edge of its swing. In front of her a collection of crystals laid out in uniform lines. So I've got managed to get into alliteration and I'm setting up um, for a metaphor here. So the soldiers of homeopathy uh, lay their purposes um, out in front of them, willing to change a life. So I've got another extended metaphor going on here. Placed further back, giant domes of amethyst uh, stood dancing merrily in the sunlight, coaxing people to the stall for a closer inspection. Dream catchers fluttered in the wind as they hung from the front of the stall's crisp, clean canvas. Sequins and gems sewn elegantly um, Where did we get to? So energy on to their bodies. So again, I'm um, I'm now anthropomorphizing these um, dream catchers saying that they have bodies uh, refracted the soft summer sun that rained down onto the scene. So I'm managing to get an oxymoron in there saying sun and rain going together as well. Right, so that's your what a good one looks like. Um, so if it was extended, if it was longer, this would be a top band mark. Um, it just requires a bit more detailing. Yeah, you can talk about the history um, if you want to. Um, no, do not write a poem. You're not being asked to write a poem you're being asked to write descriptive prose um 
I had someone recent actually write a really beautiful um, poem of similes, um, which was fantastic, but I'd asked him to write me a story with some similes in. It's different. Um, so you need to make sure that um, you are writing in prose, you are writing in paragraphs. Yeah? Um, right. Any questions then? Um, that you guys have for me anything you want me to explain again anything you want me to go over um, any sort of burning uh, questions thoughts that you think oh my goodness I'm not sure what I'm doing um, anything that you'd like me to go in um, go over in more detail tomorrow anything along those lines now is your time to shoot me loads of questions so um, all of those are answered Oh, that's lovely, Emma. Thank you. Um, that's lovely. Dracula is a fantastic book. Um, it's a good read. A tricky read. Um, 19th centuries are usually um, a little bit more dense in their um, vocab. Um, but uh, yeah, it is a really good read. I listen to most of it actually as an audio book. Um, just because it's quite bulky. Um, but that is lovely. Thank you, Emma. If you did do a poem, how many marks would you lose? <sighs> um, a lot. Um, even if it was fantastic, you haven't been asked to write a poem. Um, it's difficult. I've never asked anyone asked me whether they can do that. So, um, without looking at the mark scheme off the top of my head, um, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where you were falling, but you wouldn't be fulfilling um, the task that you've been given um, because you are expected to write in full paragraphs. You would lose you would lose marks for content because the likelihood is is that if you write a poem, it's not going to be very long because poems require a lot more craft and a lot more time than a piece of descriptive writing as prose would. Um, yeah. Don't, yeah, just don't, don't do it. Um, Proud Smile, right, I will flip back to Proud Smile. So this is Proud Smile. So this is just um, a little mnemonic for you guys to remember um, a load of different language devices and features. Um, by no means, um, is Proud Smile definitive? There are more that you could talk about, but this is sort of the best one I've come across whilst teaching for you guys to actually remember the vast majority of stuff. Um, so that's what Proud Smile means. How many quotes do you suggest you remember from books and poems? Right. Poems. Poems are really really tricky um so then the nice thing is that you will have one poem in front of you um it's it's how long is a piece of string really um if you are someone who really struggles to remember quotations find one key quotation for each so that's the bare minimum that teachers i think will ask you to do one really juicy quotation for each one i personally would be aiming for around five for each um as many as you can essentially uh, the more the better because that means you can create um you've got more options open to you books again more than poems just because it's longer um I mean, you will find lists and lists of quotations out there, particularly for um, an Inspector Calls, Lord of the Flies, Jekyll and Hyde, because they're just generally the most popular ones. Uh, Blood Brothers as well. As many as you can manage, um, the more the better. Um, yeah, I would. I don't want to put a number on it, really. Maybe 20 maybe as sort of like a sort of what you should be aiming for as a minimum i don't know 
it's it depends on each person how you work what sort of grades you're trying to get as well that plays into it so it, yeah that is a really difficult one in terms of uh, how long is a piece of string um how long should we read every day um i'd say try and read half hour a day if you read more fantastic but i think half an hour is quite a nice solid commitment to make and um, that's usually how much i read a day um just because that's all i well it's not all i have time for there's just other stuff i want to do in the day as well as read um and work so yeah i'd say half an hour is a nice is a nice target to set yourself every day but obviously um you know if you want to read more that's brilliant um right how much of the day would you recommend working for good question um i found recently actually some really nice um on timetables on pinterest um and i assume if you googled them they would come up as well obviously because they're on the internet pinterest is a website um for quarantine timetabling for students um which it puts out a really nice sort of uh sections of the day of what you should be doing um so at school you would be working five hours a day right usually in terms of lessons um then maybe doing a couple of hours homework and revision um so i'd say something along those those lines so i would say count this as an hour for working um and any other of um, the, the webinars that you go to count that as an hour um and then doing some independent stuff maybe one two three hours if you're feeling really ambitious but make sure you get a good work-life balance that you're not feeling totally drained all the time um by go by doing so much work um and overloading yourself i did it at as level and um it took me a very long time to recover from it i just all i did was revise i did very well but um my my work-life balance completely went out the, the window i didn't have a life i didn't go out and do anything else um i mean obviously restricted we're going out at the moment aren't we but make sure you know you're going out and doing your doing a bit of exercise or going out and sitting in the garden or doing doing a hobby that you enjoy make sure that you still make time for that um otherwise you tend to lose your motivation really quickly particularly in the situation that we're in in the moment in terms of um not knowing how long we're going to be stuck like this um so making sure that um you are making sure that you are happy and healthy as well both physically and mentally don't overdo yourself um right have i missed anything else um i think i've picked up everything um i think that's everything tilly have i missed anything not as far as i can see i'll just um i'll just scroll through because i know we've had a lot of um good engagement in the chat today so we can sometimes miss things we did have a question for you right at the staff so start so is maths higher or foundation today um, ah, okay good question um so unless it specifies on the timetable that a session is foundation the session will cover higher so um as usual with molly who covers our sort of regular um math sessions that will cover um higher tier um content so yes that will be um suitable for you then um, and if it says foundation on the timetable that'll just only be foundation um content and questions um let's have a look I think that looks like all the questions. Um, someone saying uh, thank you for today's lesson. It was very helpful, which is lovely. Oh, someone's thank writing you. a blog. That's very interesting. That's very good practice as well. Absolutely. Um, lovely. Um, Vicky, unless you have anything to add for today's session, we can finish um, a few minutes early today. Yeah, I mean unless there's anything anyone wants me to go over or anything that you're um concerned with in sense of there's still something in question five that i feel we should have looked at which we haven't looked at um which we which i would like to look at tomorrow um now's your time to quickly shout about that so i can build it in um i'll just quickly tell you what we're doing tomorrow actually just so we're all on the same page um so tomorrow we're doing um 
themes and motifs and language techniques and tomorrow we'll be looking more at language devices how they work why they're important although we have been doing that throughout the week um, we'll be looking between we're looking at the difference between themes and motifs and then how to use a motif in writing so we'll uh, pop that one up today um, so that would be great um, thank you very much Louise that's lovely thank you um, yeah I think that's everything then Tilly Brilliant, thanks Vicky. Um, I ah, think we'll... Hold on a minute. Instead of Proud Smile, is there any other good techniques for question five? Yeah, so I'll build those in for tomorrow, but we've generally covered the vast majority of them as well. Perfect, thank you, and thanks for that question. Um, cool, we'll wrap up there then. Um, and if you join us for any other sessions, um, just a reminder of what we've got coming up this afternoon. Um, we have maths, um, and we have chemistry, but if you just join us for English, then we'll see you tomorrow again at 11am. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and see you soon. Bye. Bye.